The LA Clippers are 1-0, but can they go 2-0? They'll be without Kawhi Leonard and John Wall, who are load managing. They will play against the Phoenix Suns on Sunday, I assume. But for this one, we're going at Sacramento. We had another crossover, this time with Matt George of Locked On Kings to get the Sacramento side of things. First time the Clippers are playing DeMontis Sabonis with the Sacramento Kings. That's on today's Locked On Clippers. You are Locked On Clippers. Your daily Los Angeles Clippers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, I'm Matt George, host of the Locked on Kings podcast. Joining me, Darian Vaziri, host of the Locked on Clippers podcast. Clippers 1-0, Kings 0-1. Both teams gearing up for their meeting in Sacramento on Saturday. The Kings have had a couple of days to correct their mistakes from their loss to the Portland Trail Blazers. Looking forward to this game. And the Clippers are coming off of a good start that, uh, Darian, the Clippers had to wait a while just to play their first game, man. So I, I credit you, uh, your and the Los Angeles Clippers fans' patience level because I was dying on opening night of the NBA for Kings basketball. First of all, I want to say thanks uh, for the collab. I'm excited to be here, excited to collab with Locked On Kings. And yeah, it was it was a little wait, especially considering Kawhi Leonard. Oh my God. Considering Kawhi Leonard being out for over a year, it was a longer wait for that. But it all worked out. Clippers are back on the court. 1-0. It wasn't pretty the first game against the Lakers. 22 turnovers. And I don't think it's going to be easy going into a tough place to play. Sacramento is never easy. And it's a pretty exciting young team. Well, that might be the difference between where the Clippers are at and where the Kings are at. Because the Clippers played a not great game, you're saying, and found a way to win. The Sacramento Kings played a somewhat solid, also at times, bad game. Head coach Mike Brown wasn't happy with the the effort of the Sacramento Kings compared to how they played during training camp and preseason. But still, they were very much in that game and found a way to lose. That just speaks to, in my opinion, just where these two teams uh, are at. But heading into this game, the first thing I want to ask you about and get an update from you and, and the lock on, Locked On Clippers perspective is we hear the possibilities of maybe the Clippers aren't going to be at full strength, which to Kings fans who watch Kings basketball consistently, that might actually scare us more than make us excited. But what is the situation with Kawhi and John Wall and Paul George heading into this matchup on Saturday? So the Clippers play on Sunday against the Phoenix Suns in the home opener. I think Kawhi Leonard will be playing in front of the fans and against a, you know, a team that not only beat the Clippers in the Western Conference Finals, but won 64 games last season, and you'd say is the better team. So I would say Kawhi Leonard and John Wall are going to load manage against the Kings. Paul George should be playing, and the Clippers have so much depth. The rest of the guys will be playing, but Kawhi Leonard and John Wall, I think, will be rested against Sacramento. Yeah, some people might look that as a bullet dodge for the Kings, but truly, especially last season, when the Kings took on teams that were not at full strength, they allowed other guys to beat them. And you talk about the depth of the Los Angeles Clippers. I think the depth is a strength of the Sacramento Kings this year, and the Kings will finally, I think, we believe, have Keegan Murray. Uh, all signs point to Keegan Murray actually being set to make his debut. So Kings fans are excited about that. But talking about the depth for both these teams a little bit, what is it about the Clippers' depth in your mind that even without Kawhi, even without John Wall, Sacramento Kings fans and the Kings themselves should really game plan hard for, in addition, of course, to Paul George? Well, I'd say Norman Powell and Marcus Morris are capable, as well as Reggie Jackson, are capable of scoring 15 to 20 points on any given night. I'd say the main thing is to be careful of the three-point shot where the role players run run guys off the three-point line and force them to get into the mid-range or attack the basket. And I would really say Paul George has had a real hesitancy in the preseason and in the game against the Lakers to go to the basket. You know, he's settled for a lot of jump shots, and I think if, you, if the Kings get him to settle for a lot of jump shots, they take him out of rhythm. And then if Paul George doesn't play well, when Kawhi Leonard and John Wall are not playing, gives the Sacramento Kings a really good chance to get that first win of the season. But a, a guy that I would really say is a someone that you probably don't game plan for, but you really should, Luke Kennard. If you can prevent that guy from getting open threes as much as possible, 
then you have a good chance to beat the Clippers. The guy missed two shots in preseason, and he made all his threes in the Laker game. And um, I, I guarantee, I wouldn't say guarantee, but I've been telling listeners he's going to shoot 50% from three this season. Well, Luke Kennard is someone that I know and we've seen in the past in, in his time in Sacramento, mainly when he was with Detroit, uh, how much of a flamethrower he can be from three-point range. And the Kings have a tendency to sometimes let those guys slip away. Now, we're hoping a lot of the Kings' tendencies of the past are starting to be broken down and gotten rid of by uh, new head coach Mike Brown. But let's talk about really quickly the, the, the Kings' perspective on this. From a Clippers standpoint, what is concerning about playing the Kings or what do you think the Kings or rather the Clippers are game planning hard for on the Kings side? Well, if you remember in the 2019, 20 season, the Clippers, I believe lost two games at home to the Kings. And if I'm not mistaken, lost one in 2021 as well. And the reason why I mentioned those two years is because Kawhi was healthy. De even though he probably won't play on Saturday, but De'Aaron Fox uh, his speed getting uh, coming off screens and just guarding him in the pick and roll can be very tough. He's got the ability to hit the floater, and he's very explosive going to the basket. The Clippers have struggled at times with quicker guards, and De'Aaron Fox is a fairly tall, like long arms, athletic guard, and the Clippers have struggled with him at times. So I'm interested to see how much small ball the Clippers are going to play in terms of switching everything and trying to take away De'Aaron Fox's downhill looks at the rim. But I'm also interested. I think this is the first time the Clippers are playing the Kings with Sabonis. Mm. So I'm really excited to see how tough it's going to be. And I think that's one counter to the small ball. If the Clippers do go small. If Sabonis is on the floor, I would look to get him involved in the post because he's one of those players that can really actually score in the post and is a good, just good touch around the basket and can has those true big men tendencies as well. So that may be a concern. I think it was... I, Actually, I went to a game against the Kings last season uh, where the Terrence Davis made every single three he took. Mm -hmm. So I really hope the Clippers don't get burned in the three ball by, by him. But it's mainly De'Aaron Fox and Sabonis. And that would bring me to ask you, how, have that, how has that duo been so far for the Kings? Even though last season you probably didn't get to see them really get time to really mesh. But now they have a full training camp. How did it look in that first game? Because league pass, my league pass app was killing me. I didn't get to watch any of the game. <laughs> yeah. De'Aaron Fox shined. He had an excellent game, a 33.7 assists, seven rebound performance, did turn the ball over eight times and didn't score in the final rounded up five minutes of the game, which ended up hurting uh, the Kings in this one. But he, he looked every bit of the star that the Sacramento Kings need him to be, especially from three point range. I think he went four or five. Uh, from three or four of six from three-point range or something like that, which is really, really good for him. Um, but as a whole, the Sacramento Kings as a team shot over 43s in this game, which is something that Mike Brown and his coaching staff have said he wants the Kings to do, but it wasn't necessarily the type of threes that the Kings want. So uh, we'll, we'll get back to this because I want to ask you a question about the three-point defense of the Clippers. But going back to Fox and Sabonis, Sabonis actually had a, I don't want to say unimpactful, but not as good of a night as the Kings would expect out of their best slash second best player and their, their big man. Now, I give the Portland Trailblazers credit. I thought they actually did a pretty good job defending DeMontis Sabonis. So I don't know if it's if we should look at this as a, okay, Sabonis didn't play great in game one. He's coming out with a chip on his shoulder in game two. Beware Clippers or maybe Fox and Sabonis and this new Kings team are still trying to figure everything out. There've been times where Sabonis has honestly been too passive because he's such a good passing big that you want him to score a little bit more. So I do believe that the Kings would, would, would stick to a Sabonis lineup. If the Clippers went small and try and punish that lineup on the offensive end, they wouldn't be afraid to, uh, to keep him out there. Even if there's questions about how that would affect the, uh, the defense, but, there's belief that that pairing is going to do really well. And what's great about DeMontis Sabonis too, is he pairs so well with everybody else on the floor. Cause everybody can roll off him, cut off him. Uh, he can set screens for everybody. Um, so I'm, I'm not too worried about that pairing going forward. I definitely think the Clippers should be, uh, but they should also be paying close attention to the, the three point shot. How many three point shooters are on this Kings roster and the difference between a high quality and a, average quality three-point shot that the Kings are looking for because they're being they're especially in preseason they've been able to create a lot of high quality three-point shots yeah I guess preventing the open threes is all about containing the dribble penetration obviously guys are going to be open when guys are over helping and are forced to help 
So that's a big reason why Ty Lue likes to go with that switch everything scheme to make teams play in isolation and prevent more of those. De'Aaron comes off the screen, gets downhill, big man needs to step up, and someone needs to help the helper, finding an, and then De'Aaron will find an open shooter. So it's all about staying in front. And just I'm really interested just to see the lineups. You know, Ty Lue said that if it's a Zubats, would come out at like the five minute, six minute mark of first quarters, and then they play a small ball lineup with Robert Covington and Nico Batum. But in the Laker game, because of Anthony Davis, I think the the Clippers didn't go to that. They kept Zubats in all the way up until like the three minute mark. And if it's a Zubats, actually ended up playing thirty five minutes, which is a lot for him. Not saying I don't like him playing those that amount of minutes, but. He's been a guy who everyone says Zoo should play more minutes. Zoo should play more minutes. But there are times where the Clippers have looked so good with the small ball lineups being able to switch everything and obviously space the floor so much on the offensive side of things that Zubats can sit on the bench for extended minutes. But he really is a very good center. I mean, if he averaged 29, 30 minutes a game, he would average a double-double, no, no doubt in my mind. He's been really close to that number the last couple of years anyway. So I'm interested to see if the Clippers use that same Anthony Davis approach with Zubats and keep Zubats in whenever Sabonis is in. That could very well be a thing. Well, you mentioned defending and, and staying in front of your man. And, and, and a lot of what Mike Brown was frustrated about, even though the Kings still shot uh, around 40% from three-point range, I, I can't exactly remember, but they took 40-plus attempts. Mike wasn't super pleased with the looks that the Kings were getting on the perimeter because a lot of them weren't coming off of paint touches, attacking the paint, things of that nature. So is in your mind, the Clippers game plan for this, is it still to kind of contain the paint? And if the Kings beat you from three and hit a lot of three point shots, they beat you. Or do you think the Kings are, or rather the, the Clippers are going to be more willing to spread things out, take away that three-point shot for guys like a Kevin Herter, maybe a Harrison Barnes, a Keegan Murray if he plays, uh, and then rely on their switching and their help defense for guys like Fox and Sabonis and, and anyone who wants to cut and try and attack the basket. You know, that's a hard question to answer because it's still so early in the season and you don't have a previous matchup to really go off of. I mean, going back to last season, it's a different team. You know, Keegan Murray, Kevin Herter, these guys have and Sabonis have all come into this Kings team. So I'd say based on previous matchups, even though the Clippers did get killed by Terrence Davis, especially in one game last season, I'd say it's to limit De'Aaron Fox. I mean, you said 33 points in the first game. It's a pretty good start to the season. I think it's going to be to limit easy baskets. And I'd say if I had to choose, it would be to force the Kings to get hot from the outside. But it's really going to be all about, as you said, what kind of looks the Kings get. If the Clippers can make the Kings take some semi-contested threes and work hard for every shot, then it'll be okay. But if they're getting open shots and De'Aaron Fox is carving the Clippers defense apart, then I think things could get ugly for the Clippers, especially you know, the Kings have some younger players and – the Clippers have struggled at times. It's kind of an older roster. The Clippers struggled at times with athletic, more athletic teams that can play a little bit faster. In particular, in particular, Memphis uh, gave us a lot of problems last season. So I'm interested to see how it works out. It's just going to be exciting to see the Kings for the first time this season in this in new Kings team. When you, you talked about the next night, the Clippers have the Phoenix Suns. The next night, the Kings have the the Golden State Warriors. So the Kings aren't necessarily looking at either of these two teams as gettable. They're just hoping to get one, maybe two, versus the Clippers might look at the Kings as significantly more gettable than the, the Phoenix Suns. Um, do, is is that how you think the, not that the Clippers are disrespecting the Kings by any means, because I know Ty Lue and that roster is, is smart enough not to, to do anything like that, but do you think the Clippers feel confident in their ability to defeat the Sacramento Kings without uh, Wall and Kawhi potentially so much so that they're they're willing to make this move and this decision? Is, is, it, is it really more in your mind about the home opener versus the Suns than it is about, okay, we don't need to be at full strength to defeat Sacramento? I think it is as well as Kawhi Leonard and John Wall, especially Kawhi, is, are, are going to sit out back-to-backs. Kawhi Leonard is going to sit out back-to-backs, and it's not even just about the Suns. I think it's also just about the home opener for the fans. I think there is a level of for the organization to play Kawhi Leonard in front of the fans. I'll probably be in attendance on Sunday. I don't really think it's disrespecting the Kings as much as it is what I said just now, but also the Clippers have shown the ability under Ty Lue to win games 
without Kawhi Leonard, but also without both Kawhi Leonard and Paul George. Last season, Paul George missed 51 games, and the Clippers still won. And obviously, Kawhi missed 82 games, and the Clippers won 42 games. So it's just because he gets the guys motivated. The Clippers are very deep. And more often than not, last uh, the Laker game wouldn't be a good example. But the Clippers' ball movement is is usually very good and they run some some creative sets not warriors creative but they run some creative sets that are since Ty Lue is impl- just coming to the become the head coach of the clippers much more creative offense than what we saw with uh glenn rivers so it's going to be a fun game i as a clipper fan i expect the clippers to win because i don't think that is it's not even anything against the kings mm. most teams that the clippers play even without Kawhi leonard i think they should be good enough to beat we're going to talk about the where we view both teams in the Western Conference. We're also going to talk about and kind of share the 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 tip of how the Kings beat the Clippers, how the Clippers beat the Kings. We're going to get to all that in just a second after uh, we tell you a little bit about Bet Online. Now, Bet Online is a phenomenal way uh, for you to get all that sports gambling in. Right now, it's the number one spot for all your football. Uh, whether it's college or professional gambling, your basketball gambling, all NBA season with college basketball as well. BetOnline.net has you covered. Uh, and and uh, Darian, right, while I look up the line, because I haven't actually seen the line for tonight's game, uh, tell me a little bit about what you think BetOnline does best. Because for me, I'm a big fan of like their future bets and the prop bets and the things they put up in addition to their game lines. But when you, you talk about BetOnline and, and, and participating in BetOnline.net, what is it that uh, draws your attention? Well, I'm not a huge better per se, but I think what interests me is the MVP odds and seeing how low Kawhi Leonard and Paul George were. However, considering their injury history, that is not a bad thing to have them kind of low. Although what really caught my eye is obviously the Clippers being a top three favorite to win the title. And that you'll probably find that on most betting websites, but I like to see my team very high. And it doesn't surprise me that, like you said, the uh, the uh, both Paul George and Kawhi uh, were so low. Although some people have a great chance of uh, of making good money off of that. I'm on BetOnline.now or dot net right now, and a line has not yet been created uh, for the Kings and Clippers for tomorrow night's game. So they're still trying to figure this out. If I'm guessing, it's the the Clippers might actually be slight underdogs because if Kawhi and uh, uh, and John Wall don't play, but we're talking maybe a point or two, so it should be a pretty even matchup. If you want to gamble on that game, uh, if you want to gamble on other sports like MMA, boxing, and golf, you can do so on Bet Online, where the game starts. All right, getting back into our conversation what do the Sacramento Kings have to do to defeat the Los Angeles Clippers? For me, make the open threes and limit Paul George. I think Paul George, if he doesn't play well when Kawhi's not there and John Wall's not there, yes, the Clippers have other guys that can, you know, make up for it. But when your best player doesn't play well and you only really have one star out there, it really can help your chances. And Paul George has this tendency when he has bad games, he can have really bad games. So if the Kings can hold him to an inefficient shooting night, I think the Kings' chances are really strong. And continuing to move the ball and making the Clippers' defense work, generating open threes, and if they get hot from three, uh, the Clippers could be in trouble, especially with that home crowd. Sacramento has a really good fan base, and it's never easy to play there. So that's what I would say. Hit the open threes, and if you can force Paul George to have a tough game, that would be huge. Now, when you say an inefficient night for Paul George, is there like a number if you if Paul George gets this number or better, the Clippers have a really good chance uh, of winning? You're talking points or like efficiency? Uh, either or, but really points is what I'm looking at. Like he has to have a 30-point game for the Clippers to win, or if you hold him to 25, the Kings are probably in good shape. I think if you hold him to under 25 points and I'd say under 42%, chances are really strong. One thing I noticed too is – when the Clippers went to their small ball unit against the Lakers, the Lakers started giving them a taste of their own medicine and switching the screens that were set. Everybody besides Anthony Davis, basically, that was getting put in pick and roll, whether it was the – I noticed the Clippers ran a lot of small, small, small 
pick and rolls. Like, for example, Kennard would be setting the screen on Paul George and try to go for that quick slip. One thing the Lakers are doing to kind of snuff that out was switching the, those at the top of the key. And the big reason why that works is because there are certain guys like Robert Covington, Nicholas Batum, Luke Kennard. They're not the type of guys that are going to take advantage of mismatches if they have a two or three height, uh, th two or three inch size advantage. Like you could get away with switching De'Aaron Fox onto a Robert Covington for a possession or even a Kevin Herter onto a Nicholas Batum. I'd say the main thing is you got to rebound, but those aren't the type of guys that are going to take advantage of that. So if the Kings can switch some of those ball screens, especially with the guards and forwards setting them on Paul George and Reggie and those guys, they will take away a lot of open threes for the Clippers and force the Clippers into isolation. And one of the things I've noticed about the Clippers over the last couple of years, when teams switch everything on them, they tend to take a lot of bad shots and contested threes. So if the Kings can force the Clippers to take those contested threes and not move the ball and get open looks, chances are very high for them to win. I really, I'm more worried about this game than I was going into the season because I saw the way the Clippers played against the Lakers and it wasn't very pretty. <laughs> There, there is a good chance, though, that Paul George can take the tough night that he had, kind of move, remove some of the rust, recognize that a lot is on his shoulders with how shorthanded the Clippers are, and, and that's where you know diamonds really shine brightest. Maybe you get the Indiana Pacers version of young Paul George who makes an appearance uh, back in Sacramento, which I'm sure Kings fans uh, are fearful of. But in order to defeat the Sacramento Kings, it's, it's funny. It's almost the opposite in some ways. Like on one hand, I would say if the Clippers get other people involved, then they're probably in a really good spot because the Kings are going to give opportunities to guys like Luke Kennard, to the more uh, to Morris, to to guys like Nicholas Batum, who will get opportunity to score, to shine. Uh, Reggie Jackson's another one too. If 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 guys are ready to step up, next man uh, next man up mentality. The Sacramento Kings are a team that'll allow you to uh, or have historically allowed you to kind of get yours and showcase yourself a little bit. It seems like a lot of players just come into games against the Kings with a confidence that they're going to get theirs. And Mike Brown is trying to obviously change that. But on the other side of things, like I would say in the past, if you, if you limit De'Aaron Fox, the Kings chances of winning are, are, are next to nothing. Now they have such significant depth that the Kings can get away with a Fox game that's not great. And what we saw during the preseason, what we saw on opening night is Kevin Herter can get going. He had 23 points. I expect DeMontis Sabonis to be better. Keegan Murray likely going to play. Keegan is potentially uh, a 16 plus points per game guy. Uh, Harrison Barnes didn't have the best of games in game one, but he's shown the ability to get hot at times. He's very streaky. Uh, you mentioned Terrence Davis who torched the Clippers last time uh, they played. So the Kings have a lot of weapons that can get going. Now they don't want to have to rely on all those weapons getting going to win. But my point is if the Los Angeles Clippers can manage to limit that, limit the others, limit a breakout performance from someone not named De'Aaron Fox or DeMontis Sabonis and really force that star duo just to beat them, that's something we haven't seen them do yet. Uh, so that might be an efficient strategy to defeat Sacramento. Yeah, Absolutely. I also was was kind of wondering, how do you feel about Mike Brown so far as the coach? Oh, I love him. I think Mike Brown is fantastic. Um, I think he has a very tough job of of changing a culture in Sacramento that is so deeply rooted in lo losing that uh, it's it, it carries a, a a plethora of bad habits that regardless of how many new players and new coaching staff you have here, those bad habits just continue to stick around. There have been so many players that have come and gone and so many coaches that have come and gone over the last 16 seasons that you would think we're all the same people because they make the same mistakes. And what's funny is after the Kings lost to the Blazers, one of the first things that Brown said was, I didn't recognize that team tonight compared to what we were doing in training camp and in preseason. We weren't making these mistakes in training camp and preseason. And it, it speaks volumes to us in Sacramento because we know when the lights are brightest, when the games matter, just these old bad habits creep uh, creep back in. And those are bad habits that I know the Clippers are aware of, the Clippers can exploit, and Mike Brown is going to have to really work to try and break. So I'm hoping having practice days on Thursday and Friday after the loss on Wednesday can help this team refocus on Saturday. And maybe there's that element of, okay, opening night wasn't who we are. Sorry, Clippers. This is who we are. We're going to make an example of you, not not because we're better than you, but just because we we figured things out. Uh, so there is maybe the element of that narrative playing out. Maybe Kings fans have their fingers crossed that the Kings can play out that narrative. But historically, the Kings 
find ways to lose games that they're very much in. And if this game goes down to the wire, the Clippers can almost count on one or two costly mistakes that if the Clippers exploit them correctly, they'll win the game. Yeah, I was about to ask or say, I have a feeling this one's going to go down to the wire. And I would ask, what's the confidence in you uh, for the Kings to win a close game? And if you're not confident, why is it the Kings struggle so much to close out games? Well, I actually was pretty confident in the Kings' ability to close out and defeat the Portland Trailblazers on Wednesday night. They just made some some costly errors. And and like I mentioned earlier, like De'Aaron didn't score in the last five minutes. DeMontis Sabonis only had two points in the fourth quarter. Like the Kings, in a lot of ways, especially with their their own turnovers, they turned the ball over 16 times. Like they, they just had a lot of un, unforced errors and and bad mistakes that were costly. There were also some questionable foul calls at times uh, and costly foul calls that switched the momentum. So closing or getting over that proverbial hump and just closing out a game is always something that the Kings have struggled with. So I do have confidence in this team's ability to close out a game. I think the idea, the, the belief is that the Kings can compete on any given night. So the Kings will have more than their fair share of opportunities in close games. So I wouldn't be nervous or, 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 or scared per se of the Kings in that moment. I would expect the Clippers to be more comfortable and better equipped in those moments than the Kings are. It doesn't mean the Kings can find a way to close it out. Uh, but especially when it comes to just decision-making and unforced errors or self-inflicted errors, the Kings hurt themselves a lot of times at the end of the game more than an opposing team hurts them. You think that comes down to youth or, or just players – I, to make mistakes. I, I mean, wouldn't call it youth. I'd call it inexperience because the okay. Kings aren't a young team. Yeah. They just are an inexperienced team when it comes to winning basketball. And, and they do have a lot more experienced players that are on the roster now who have won elsewhere. But as a unit, as a group, they're still figuring that out. And when you're led by a player in De'Aaron Fox, who's very, very good, but has never even come close to sniffing postseason basketball before, he has to learn that lesson still as well. Uh, to some capacity and he as the king star needs to learn how to close out games like nba stars are able to um so it's 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 more inexperienced in that moment that honestly the kings just need to learn by doing yeah i mean it really comes down to in those close games your stars your stars to take you home and i think the biggest key more than anything for the clippers in this game is paul george to be the best player on the court if paul george is the best player on the court clippers have a great chance to win but it's oftentimes when you know, he should be the best part of court with Sabonis and De'Aaron Fox, who are great players. This is Paul George we're talking about. He should outplay them and have a great game, especially coming off that bad game against the Lakers. But you just never know. Let's wrap up with this. Looking at where the, the Clippers and Kings could, should, will finish uh, in the standings in the Western Conference. We'll start with the Clippers because everybody expects them to be significantly higher than the Kings, let's be honest. And a lot of it has to do with you look at the Clippers roster, you look at the big three and go, and well, especially Kawhi and Paul George being healthy together and go, okay, those are major names. That's a star, powerful team. Wow, who's the third? We have a big three now? Is John uh, Wall I mean, the third? Maybe John Wall's the third. I don't know. Maybe. Like, or maybe, I mean, Nick Batum would like to insert himself in there. And I know how- John Wall is a bit. John Wall is a better chance than, than Nico. I love Nico, but he's he's a role player, bona fide. I know he's I know he's a fan favorite over there in in Los Angeles, and he's oh, yeah. been a Kings killer over the course of his career. But really, um, I, he's had moments, especially when he was with Portland. Man, he when he was playing with Lamarcus Aldridge, and Aldridge and and Young Dame would take so much attention. Nicholas Batum would hit big shot after big shot against the Kings at times back in the day, but. Um, Maybe it's not a big three. Maybe it's either just those big two, that all-star power that they have uh, at uh, at the wing. Where do you think the Los Angeles Clippers belong in the standings conversation? Because for me personally, Clippers aren't at the top for me. Clippers aren't really close to the bottom for me. They're right smack dab in the middle, assuming that they're going to have the season like we expect, which is resting guys at times. But for the most part, guys are staying healthy. I expect them right in like that three to six range. Wow, I would say that's that's lower than most Clipper fans expect them. I mean, I I think I I I don't usually say these kind of things, but I think the Clippers should look to get the number one seed. Like I'm serious. I think Kawhi Leonard and Paul George are gonna miss around 20 games. If I had to guess, Paul George shouldn't miss 20 games. But I just feel like he'll have a small injury somewhere. Hmm. 
But if the Clippers have Kawhi Leonard and Paul George play 60 plus games, they should be able to finish around 55 to 60 wins to me because they've shown the ability to win games without them. And that's why I'm just taking it one game at a time and tackling each game with, with what's in front of us. And for example, this Kings game, no Kawhi, no John Wall, probably the announcement will come out tomorrow, uh, Saturday morning and they should still get the job done for me. Will they? I'm not sure, but considering 42 games, with Paul George out for 51 of them, and then Kawhi Leonard out for 82 of them, mm-hmm. and then you add in Norman Powell, who was who only played three games in the regular season for the Clippers last year, and John Wall. I mean, the depth is so high. The team has been together for three years now in the Ty Lue era. This is Ty Lue's third season as coach. A lot of these guys, it's their third year playing together. To me, they should finish right around the top because you know the Warriors are going to have load management for their stars, and they have a lot of depth too. And then, you know, the Denver Nuggets have to work Jamal Murray back into their their system. There's a lot of questions about the Suns. Jaron Jackson Jr. is out for Memphis. I just don't see, like, there's no reason why the Clippers shouldn't try to be better than these teams. But I can also see the injury concerns having people put them around that three to six range. It's just that I believe that the Clippers need to get a top three seed to win the championship because only two teams in the history of the NBA since the shot clock era have won a championship being lower than a three seed, and that's the 69 Celtics and the 95 Rockets. So history says you got to be a top three seed. Well, where do you think the Sacramento Kings are? I'm guessing you don't have them as a top three seed then. No, but <laughs> I – so I think the Sacramento Kings are obviously going to be fighting for those play-in spots. Mm-hmm. I think the West got better. For example, I mean, the Timberwolves went out and got Gobert. The Pelicans, I mean, geez. Really good. Like, they are going to be scary, and they're a bad matchup for the Clippers too. And then – the Blazers got Damian Lillard back. So that's obviously like a big thing for them. Now, I want the Sacramento Kings to make the play in over the Blazers because it's been since the first year I was really old enough to start watching basketball and remembering it, that 2006 season where Kevin Martin made that game winner against the Spurs. Yep. Uh, I'll never forget that. But it's it would be nice to see Sacramento get a postseason game. So I had them 11th, but the only reason I had them 11th it's because of what we said at the top of the show. The King, they're the Kings. It's the same way people used to always say and still think the Clippers will never win a championship. It's the Clippers. There's this aura around them of losing that kind of surrounds these two franchises. Obviously more so the Kings right now than the Clippers. But that's why I have them finishing 11th. But you know what? This is locked on Kings and locked on Clippers crossover. I'm going with the 10th seed. Kings get that final spot. I appreciate that. Well, the fact that you say it's the Kings is actually perfect in reality because that's essentially what it is. Like the Kings are fighting themselves just as much as they're fighting everybody else in in, in the West. Like if the Kings can exercise their own demons, I'm confident in their ability to compete with almost every team on any given night. Now I'm not expecting the Kings to be right in the mix of the playoff picture. I would said before, like best case scenario for this team is probably like seven or eight seed, which they would happily take. Cause I would love to have a home play in game of some sort in Sacramento for the fans to enjoy. Uh, if nothing else, even if that's not real playoff basketball, but look, the, the Kings, have high expectations they have a roster to actually back it up if everybody plays to the level that we're capable of playing if mike brown can coach to the level that we believe he's capable of coaching if the defense can have a little bit of a pulse consistently this season so i i I do think let's put it this way if the kings aren't a play-in team something is really wrong so I don't know who survives let's put it that way i I think if the kings aren't a play-in team barring kind of catastrophic injury or anything like that there is an air of dear god what are we, where do we go from here so i don't think that's even a possibility or an acceptable outcome for sacramento at this point they will be playing some sort of postseason basketball even if postseason and playoffs are very different they will be playing some sort of postseason basketball this year uh or or things are, are going to be in a panic well finally with this game on friday or on saturday how you feeling about the, uh, the the Clippers' chances against the Kings? You calling your shot? You calling a Clippers win over Sacramento, even with the Clippers being shorthanded? Or do you think the Sacramento Kings have a have a chance to maybe steal one here? I think Sacramento absolutely has a chance to steal one, but I have to go with with my guys. You know, to to go two and zero, I think the performance will be better. I think Paul George will be better. I think somebody I didn't talk about enough. In this episode, Marcus Morris Sr. He's looked really good in preseason, mm. looked really solid against the Lakers. I see him having a 20 to 22 point perform, 20 to 23 points against the Kings. Honestly, I think he's going to have a really good game. And yeah, I see the Clippers winning, but in a very close game. 
I think it's going to come down to those inexperienced mistakes that hopefully the Kings will make uh, for the Clippers sake. I think the expectation should be that the Clippers will win. I'm putting all my eggs in two baskets. One, Mike Brown and his ability to correct the mistakes and refocus the team after uh, Wednesday's loss. And number two, Keegan Murray's playing his first game. And I think if you haven't watched Keegan Murray play, Keegan Murray is a really, really good player already and someone who I think is going to be a more effective player for the Sacramento Kings right out of the gate than maybe they were even expecting. Uh, So I'm putting my eggs in those baskets for a Sacramento Kings win, but I'll be honest with you, I would kind of rather play the Clippers at full strength wow. <laughs> than play the Crazy. just based off of the Kings history. That's what I'm saying. Exercising their own demons versus the the team that they're they're playing. But I, I'm I agree with you in the sense that like I think it is going to be a close game. I think it's going to be a fun game. It's going to be a fun atmosphere. And here's what I hope. I hope the Kings don't coach this game and approach this game with the thought of the next night's game against Golden State in mind. Like I don't want them to limit the playing time of other players because of the Golden State game coming up. The Clippers game is probably the more gettable out of the two, and it's at home. Go and get it, and then worry about handling your business the next night. Yeah, totally agree. Well, that's where we're at. Crossover edition, Locked on Kings, Locked on Clippers. We'll see who wins. Enjoy uh, the trash talk between the two fan bases. The LA-Sacramento rivalry doesn't stretch as deep with Kings and Clippers as it does uh, with Kings and Lakers. And I'm I'm telling you, a lot of Kings fans really enjoyed the Clippers beating up on the Lakers uh, the other night. We'll keep up the excellent work that you do over there at Locked on Clippers. Locked on Kings will keep on rolling. We'll see who's right uh, when when the final buzzer sounds. Thank you so much. It was a great time.